company and loving the company is, is that I knew we had some incredible assets. Um, innovation. I mean, we had more innovation and development and design capability than, uh, than any company uh, around. We had customers who actually were very loyal, who wanted the Xerox brand to survive, but probably the most important asset is a culture and an employee base that loved the place and would do anything um, to keep the place alive. So um, those are great assets to have when you get into trouble. So we went to work. I would have to say the first few months, um, a lot of time was spent listening, particularly to employees and customers, industry analysts, really getting a scope of the issues. I think um, we were told we had great technology, but bringing it to market was tough. And quite frankly, we better make some choices. We were spread too thin um, as it related to the, the technology curve we were, uh, we were addressing. Um, customers said that, you know, yeah, great technology, but everything's about customer experience and responsiveness, and you're really doing poorly there. Um, and employees w told us that, you know, we had lost our way in terms of, um, you know, quite frankly, engaging them um, in ways that they could make a difference and that they were willing to roll up their sleeves and work, but that we better provide great clarity about where we were going and what was required. So we laid out what I would call a fairly simple but bold plan um, on fixing the company. And one of the things that is really important in times of great stress is, is that you do focus on a few things that are measurable and that people understand. Um, we focused on cash generation. That was a lost art in the 90s. Nobody was focused on cash. Um, so we sort of got on that train before it came back into vogue. But we were going to be focused on cash generation to improve our liquidity. We knew we had a non-competitive business model, so we were going to take a few billion dollars um, out of the base of the business to improve our competitiveness. Not a pleasant task. Um, but at the same time, and this was probably the boldest part of the turnaround, um, we decided that we were going to invest in the company. We were going to invest in the future. We were going to identify where we could be successful, where we could grow the place, and while we were being ruthless in terms of cost and competitiveness, we were also going to invest in areas that would help map a future that people could have confidence in. So fortunately, um, I'm here to talk about it. Um, if you looked back um, to 2001, 2002, we were losing hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, I think we lost 300 million at our low point. And for the past few years, we've been making well in excess of a billion dollars. But I think that's um, only part of the story, um, because while we were busy certainly addressing the issues of bankruptcy, or worse, <laughs> um, we were taking steps to ensure that the goalpost post wasn't survival, it was actually succeeding. So we took $3 billion out of the cost base, but at the same time, we maintained, we shaped, we changed a lot of what we're doing, but we maintained our investments in research and development. We didn't take a dollar out of our core research and development investments. So, you know, as you reflect upon it, it probably sounds like a good decision, but at the time it was incredibly unpopular. Um, the first place financial advisors tell you to go um, is R&D. It's the quickest way um, to actually address liquidity issues. Um, I think investors and bankers at the time thought uh, I was out of touch for sure. But I kept listening to our employees and customers who knew that, you know, that avoiding financial bankruptcy was somewhat of a short-term um, solution to the problem if we were going to face a technological drought down the road. So we stayed the course. And uh, fortunately, we continued to invest in innovation. Um, so over the past few years, we've had probably the most prolific pipeline um, we've ever had in the company's history. We've brought over 100 new technologies to the market um, in the last three years. That's like one every 11 days. Um, and it's not just um, technologies. It's also services. It's um, document-related services and software that are all about managing content and information. And these investments are paying off. If you look at our financial results over the past few years, you would see that over three quarters of our technology sales actually come from technologies we've brought to market in the last 24 months. So the pace of innovation is extraordinarily important. And uh, you'd hate to think where we would be um, if we hadn't done that. So 
over the last few years, I have to say, step by step, brick by brick, we've been building a new Xerox. And our um, evolution has really turned us into a services-led technology company that now is known for innovation, customer experience, customer focus. We have um, well over now um, about 30% of our revenues that come straight from high value document services for our customers. We're helping them manage this complexity of information and, um, and helping them communicate in their businesses today. A lot of what we do has a lot more to do with providing management for content. We're a trusted partner when it comes to helping our customers make the most of their IT infrastructure and bridge the paper and digital worlds, which is really a huge um, productivity issue today. So those new technologies are generating billions of dollars of recurring revenue for Xerox. The other thing that we wanted to do was to turn into a recurring revenue company, not a transaction revenue company. That's particularly important in times like this. So today, about 72% of our revenues come from recurring revenues. They're under contract for multiple years, which gives you a much better base to build off um, as a business than just a transaction business. So we are just getting started here. The opportunities um, in terms of document intensive industries are huge. You know, think healthcare where you fill out repetitive forms all the time. Think the legal industry where documentation makes or break cases. We've developed practices for digitizing information, managing, searching, creating all sorts of uh, archival capabilities. Um, and more to make sure that truly businesses um, do have information uh, that they need when they need it. So we like to think that that's, we've, we're focused, that's our expertise. And um, not only are we building those competencies in the, inside the company, but over the last couple of years, we've spent a few billion dollars on acquisitions to support and build new competencies and, and really ensure that both sources of organic and inorganic growth are there for us. Um, so. You know, nobody would sit here today and say, you know, we're uh, kind of sitting back and relaxing uh, during this market. It's really, as you all know, tough out there, and we feel good about our progress. But um, I always say that, you know, there's not a day that I wake up where we don't have some set of challenges to deal with, some set of decisions to make that help us be more competitive and deal with uh, certainly um, that crisis around the corner that. Um, we've certainly uh, experienced. But um, although it might not have looked like the dream job when I took it, I got to tell you, I'm so grateful. It was the experience of a lifetime. And um, the understatement would be to say I've learned a lot along the way. And that's what I'd like to turn to now and just talk about what will seem very fundamental, but I truly believe are kind of some of the core lessons about running a sustainable business. Um,